Well, hello, friends, and welcome to a very special Ask Zach. Today, we are taking a field trip down to sunny California, and we are going to visit the pickup winding workshop of Ron Ellis. Now, Ron Ellis has been a good friend of mine for 20 years. We met years ago when I was a guitar tech for Brad Paisley, and since then, he's become one of the premier pickup winders in the world. And uh, I, of course, have a a bunch of his pickups and various guitars. He rewound the bridge pickup on this 57 Esquire. He even did a crazy uh, Craigslist deal for me where I wired him money. I had found this guitar in San Diego and I wired him cash because the buyer insisted on cash and uh, and he he did that for me. He bought this guitar and, and shipped it to me. So he's, he's a real minch. So, uh, Here's the important part about this video. Uh, a lot of you, you know, that have been aware of Ron know that he's had this crazy long wait list and, and such. Well, that was because he was working out of his garage in this by himself. In this video, you're gonna see that he now has his own winding facility and he has a whole team of guys working for him that are well-trained and very serious about their craft. And Ron himself is gonna take you through the process. He's gonna show you bobbins, how the magnets are put in the bobbins, how they're wound, how uh, you know the attention that they put to the, you know, the testing that they do on magnets, the testing that they do on the wire, and then the wax potting and lacquer potting and all these various things and the testing that they do to keep a really high, you know, high level product and to keep you know, consistency from pickup to pickup. So I hope you uh, enjoy this, and I hope for those of you that have been paying those outrageous prices on reverb and such, we'll just go ahead and order a set from Ron. And those of you that have thought there's some crazy wait lists, you just go ahead and contact him. All right, well, uh, I hope you enjoy this. And also, if you do, I really appreciate you supporting my work. And the best way to do that is Patreon. So the uh, there's a link to it below. There's multiple levels there that you can check out. Also, there's good old tip jar information in the description, and also there is uh, merch that you can see below or at askzack.com. All right, thank you so much, and enjoy your very unique opportunity to, uh, to see inside the Pickup Winding Workshop of Ron Ellis. Well, good morning, Zach. It's nice to have you here in the shop. Uh, we can just do a walkthrough and just, uh, you know, show you our little recipe. Uh, parts of it, of what we do here at Ron Ellis Pickup. So um, it all starts here. Basically, we manufacture um, our bobbins from start to finish. Um, starts with this four bond material, this uh, vulcanized paper uh, that's been used since the 30s. And uh, so we have different thicknesses for different pickups, um, different types. You can get it in different colors. Typically, it's in black. And uh, but anyway, we've, we've, we've got a bunch of this. And then what we do is we have our laser over here programmed. Um, and we, like right now, we have some of our Ellisonic pickups, uh, bobbins in here that we're doing. And uh, so again, we've got this program to do you know, our Ellisonics, P90s, uh, all of our single coil stuff, our Telecaster, Stratocasters. A lot, of, a lot of my time back in the garage or uh, over here the first couple months was me literally signing these. And I had to sit here with a paint pen and, and the paint pen would spit. Half the time I couldn't even sign my name and I spent tons of time um, doing that. So then what we did is we developed a way that my signature that, that I signed here is actually on here, it's programmed in. So I don't have to do that anymore. So um, the pickups are exactly the same. There's no change from the personally signed to the, the laser signed versions. So, because um, I know some people say that, well, the early ones, you know, were the, the good pickups because they were done in the garage. They're exactly the same. So anyway, so the bobbins are made here. Uh, we have to clean them up because when you, when you laser cut this material, it has a sticky residue. So we have to clean that off and we let that dry. And then um, we've got all of our different uh, magnet materials that we buy from various places um, from different manufacturers for different reasons. Um, so we've got, you know, our bar magnets um, that we use for P90s humbuckers. 
Um, again, there's there's all different types. There's, you know, we use A3, A5, sometimes A2. Um, and there's various types within that range of, of magnets, depending on what you want in sound. Um, and then I test these, a lot of these. Um, when we get new batches of magnets in, I have access to a spectrometer at work that I take these and I sample these and run these and see what the consistency is. And there's a lot of times we have to return these um, or we set them aside for different reasons. Um, because unless the ratio is right of that magnet, it's not consistent, then the sound changes. So we have to watch that. You have to, you have to control the quality of your ingredients. Well, you do. It, it's like a recipe. I mean, there, this isn't rocket science. You know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's a recipe. It's, it's like cooking food. And, you know, you have to, to keep everything consistent. Everything has to be fresh, like in a recipe. And you can't vary it. And that's because these materials vary a lot. And that's the thing that you have to do is you have to go through and you have to check and test these materials. And also the feedback to the manufacturers is helpful, you know, and I test a lot of materials in the spectrometer um, and send that data back to the manufacturers actually, which is helpful. So, um, so I mean, this is our magnets. Um, and then, you know, again, we make Telecaster, Stratocaster, um, P90s humbuckers, the Ellisonics. You'll see that we're getting into Jazzmaster pickups, bass pickups. Um, we have a huge request for that. So these are all things that we're working on and trying to develop. Um, and again, as you know, each time you come up with something like that, like I'm not a bass player, so we have to send these up to good bass players and people that are familiar with vintage pickups and get their feedback and work with us. And it just takes time. It takes a lot of time. So um, anyway, so I'll show you here. Like Calvin here is now assembling... You know, various right now he's working on Ellisonic necks. So these are Ellisonic necks. And this is literally like the old school way. I mean, this is uh, <laughs> the way that Fender did it in the early days, and we still do the same way. And obviously, as we go, there's different fixtures you can make up to make it easier. But I just like doing it this way because it's the raw way and it's the way we've done it. And it's a lot slower than, you know, a fixture where you can just drop it in, do one press. And I'm not saying that we won't go to that, but right now, this is how we do it. So it's exactly the way that I did it starting 14, 15 years ago. But, um, but there's our different magnets, different bobbins for the different runs, pickups that we do. Um, this is an Ellisonic. This is an Ellisonic here that, you know, again, we make in the laser and then we have to bond it together. Um, there's variations of the magnets that we use. There's A3, A5 that we use, and we do a different stagger. And, um, and sometimes, depending on the model that we do, sometimes there's, there's A3 and A5 within the same pickup, like my 50s, 60s, like in the Stratocaster pickups, or Tellys too that we do. Um, again, these are just examples of, uh, here's a 50, 60 neck. Uh, pickup for strap and then each one of the different models we have different staggers and we have different magnets and there's different wire and and again it's been it was developing that recipe that took years to develop that and and then now the important thing is that we again you make it exactly and you don't change it you know so again everything that comes in uh, all the materials it just changes I mean this is what pickup makers deal with you know, and, and it's it's a struggle at times. And then also the whole COVID thing hit and then the material holdup, um, you know, waiting on a lot of stuff. We've been pretty fortunate. It hasn't been that bad for us, but um, it's getting a lot better, so. But yeah, so this is, uh, and then here's, for instance, we're doing, these are Ellisonic P90s and we're trying just different prototypes, different ways. Uh, this is like a dog ear. And then we have our dog ear covers custom made. So we're trying different things there. These are all protos that we're working on right now. Um, the Ellisonics, like in the Julian guitar, the Collings JL, you know, we're doing that in uh, P90 style now, size in soap bar or and dog ear. And also some other custom work that we're doing for a guitar manufacturer that we're working on. So um, it's fun. You know, it's, it's, I mean, that's, that's the thing that, that I've always liked doing is 
I mean, we have to manufacture these and we have to keep everything going out the door. But my deal is is trying new pickups. And, and you know, that's what I do at my day job, my engineering job, is test materials, design new things, and that's kind of what makes me tick. So, so it's fun. All this is really good. Um, so anyway, we take the bobbins. Um, some of these we glue in. Um, we have to clean these up, let them cure. And then from there, then they would go over to one of our winders. And, and here's my son, Alan, Hello. who does the great majority of the winding of the pickups. Um, this is one of our new larger winders. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the green monster, we call it. Yep, it's been here for about a year now, right? We've had it about a year, and so it's a big industrial winder. We also I have, have smaller, it. smaller winders, like benchtop winders that we still use. But depending on the, the pickups here, and these are what? These are Tele... tele so that's neck. a JL. So it's a JL uh, neck pickup. And so you have different fixtures, of course, per the model that you're doing. And, uh, you know, we're continuing to develop new fixtures and, and faster, more secure ways of holding the bottoms. But this is what's worked for us from day one. It's still the same thing. So we got the JL all wound up. Um, I tend to use talc powder. Yeah, AJ Personally, likes talc powder. Use that a lot. Seems like there's a different technique for everyone. My technique gets powder everywhere. Uh, and then you really just kind of let it rip. We've already had it fastened and everything. And everybody kind of has their own technique with this. different. You know, some are scatter wound and, and then some are more layer wound. Everything we do is hand winding. We don't do any auto winding. And it's not to say that we won't in the future. There's definitely when you get into like the, the later 60s uh, into the 70s pickups, those were all auto wound. You know, and then, the, then you get into the whole humbucker thing, those were all machine wound. But there were so many inconsistencies in the winders, it's almost like they were hand wound. So each one was very different. That's why they all sound different. But um, but there's definitely a pattern that you have to keep. And um, and but that changes because the wire. And then we'll see with the wire here. We'll show you that. But the wire when you get it in, the wire varies a lot. Form bar wire is pretty consistent. Polysol wire is pretty consistent. Um, but when you get into the enamel wires, it's all over the map. The diameter changes. So you have to check that as you go through the process of, of winding, every couple of pickups you have to check the tolerances of what that wire diameter is because it'll change the output of the pickup, it'll change the sound of the pickup, the feel of the pickup and all that. So um, so anyway, this is the winding technique uh, or winding process. Um, and again, this is one of the winders and then we have a winder over here, a couple winders. So here's two other winders. These are real common with like, you know, uh, smaller winders or a lot of the, the larger winders too. Seymour Duncan, this is one of the winders that he uses. Um, and I've got one of these at home, one of the old analog style that I use. And so there's different, again, there's different fixtures. Um, this is a P90 fixture. Um, and this, we're doing some prototype stuff here. Um, the different wires that we use, um, Here's form bar. This is 42 gauge heavy form bar. Um, and then there's 42 gauge plain enamel. Um, we buy this from like four or five different manufacturers and some of the wire I have specially drawn to our specifications. Um, so what we go through with, with all of these suppliers is for instance, you know, you get 10 rolls of this, six pound rolls each. And it's specified to be a specific diameter that it's supposed to be a, a min nom. And, but as you go through the spool, that'll change. It goes out of tolerance. So then you have to compensate for that because if the wire gets thin and you put on the same amount of wire winds, um, that pickup will be hotter because when the thin wire gets thinner, it's like trying to shove high pressure water through a pipe. 
If you go through a smaller pipe, pressure goes up. Larger pipe, pressure goes down. It's kind of a similar thing with this. Um, so you have to work with the wire manufacturers and let them know because they think that that tolerance, the min num, is within this range, and it's not. It varies. So we package this stuff up, we send it back to them. Um, and, and what is the, just the, the layman's, you know, kind of version of enamel versus, you know, form bar? So, I mean, there's definitely a tonal difference. So, for instance, here's, here's polysol down here. Um, and so this is wire that's coated in some type of, uh, you know, poly type yeah. of... It's a know. cladding, basically. Yeah. So the wire is all copper. Yeah. And, you know, the wire back in the 50s, if you look at the impurities, the impurities were much greater. You know, so the, the, the copper back then was, you know, 97.5% pure copper. Um, the wire of today is very, very pure copper. It's like 99.995% pure copper. So you have to compensate for that to get that old sound. You can't, you can't wind it exactly the way that the old wire. Was. You hear these guys that say, I've got this old stash of wire. Well, some of that's true and some of it's not because most of the old wire that you use is bad. I mean, it'll break. The cladding has dried and it'll flake off. But there's ways that you can get around that where you don't have to use the old wire. But you have to experiment, you have to come up with a recipe that replicates that sound because the wire does sound different when it has a higher impurity level in it. So, but yeah. in general, polysol wire, that came along because it's much more durable, it's much more consistent. I mean, the min num on this, it's, it stays pretty accurate. Um, the, the wire changed in color over the years, like, uh, you know, the, the poly wire can be a reddish to even like a purple kind of a color. And sometimes it can actually look like some of the enamel. Some of the enamel was like a dark brown to a reddish brown uh, to kind of a purple looking hue. Um, form bar pretty much stayed the same. It can be a little bit darker or brighter. So there's a misconception sometimes on old pickups of what the wire really was. And, um, and I think that they're, you know, we, we still deal with the same problem with, with enamel. You would think in this day and age that you could make it to where it's absolutely consistent, but it's not, it varies a lot. But the polysol is consistent. I would say tonally, um, if you do the same exact pickup in form bar, it tends to have a little more presence. It's a little bit brighter on the initial attack. Um, to where enamel is like a, I would say that if you look at like a sine wave, polysol would be like that. I would say that, that form var would be like that, and enamel is a broader. It's a little bit darker. It's got a little bit more oomph on the, on the node. But that's generalizing because that'll change. It changes within the set of pickups. It changes depending on the guitar. It changes the player's hands, your attack. And so about the time you make that statement and you generalize that this wire sounds like this, because we get that all the time. AJ deals with that, that I would like you to make me a set where I want you to use polysol on the neck, form vor in the middle, and enamel. Well, then you ask them why. Why do you say that? So they've read on the forums that, well, that's what you, that you generalize on that. And it, it's okay, we kind of have to do that. But in reality, it depends on so many different factors. You know? um, and what I always do when I talk to somebody, and that's why I like to call people a lot of times, because, well, what kind of a player are you? I mean. Do you have a light touch? Do you have a heavy touch? Because, you know, getting the right set of pickups in that particular guitar for them, what string gauge, what kind of amp you use? I mean, it, it all, as you know, it, it all has a lot to do with it. So, so everything we're talking about here, we're kind of generalizing, but, um, but typically, like I say, that that's the, the form bar is a little more present. You know, you can get this in light, uh, lighter gauge, heavier gauge form bar. You can get it in different gauges in all these. And that changes everything. So, and you know, we're constantly experimenting too. I mean, I'm always, I'll think of something in the middle of the night and then either have one of the guys wind it or I'll wind it up and try it. And, and trying to come up with these recipes, I can't tell you how many times it was like midnight or one o'clock on a Friday night after working all week. And I had this great idea about these new pickups. You put them in the guitar and it's a complete failure. They sound like crap. But the thing is, You've now set a parameter. You know, what you do is you try to find the sweet spot. You go too far to the left, and then you go too far to the right, and you experience with that wire, those magnets, and that guitar, what that range is. 
Right, because you're continually narrowing the parameters yeah. because you're learning from your mistakes. Exactly, and and you have to do that. And and the thing is, it's time. It's time in. I mean, you have to put them in guitars. You have to try this different stuff. My interpretation of what it is compared to you or another guy or one of these pro players, I mean, I've sent off pickups that I think sound great, you know, to a pro player, and they're like, yeah, they sound okay. You know, I, I like your other pickups better, or vice versa. I've sent pickups off to somebody that I think, well, these sound okay, but they probably won't like them, and they flip over them, because in that guitar, in that situation, it just hits, you know? So you always got to vary all the time. And again, it kind of equates and goes back to um, cooking, I guess. You know, a little pinch of this, a little pinch of that, you know? And, and each chef has their own flavor that they've developed, and that's why people come to their restaurant. I always say, like, in the whole pickup thing, it's kind of like we make ice cream. You know, a million people make ice cream, and but what brings you back to that ice cream parlor? They just like your ice cream. So yeah. It's like some of those weird pickup sets that we get um, requested, they end up working really great. We had a really fat wound form bar pickup that came out. Um, the guy loved it. So it's like, hey, that's a variation that we can maybe utilize down the road. Yeah. Um, it's a balancing act between that and then offering just a select few amount of pickups so that you get the full range of um, what there was to offer and how Fender switched up the styles over the years. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and everything, you know, everything is feedback. I mean, you know, working, fortunately, you know, we've had a chance to work with a lot of pro players over the years and I become friends with a lot of those guys and their feedback is huge because the pro players, they just want something that works for them. They're not reading a bunch of stuff on forums. They're not reading into anything. It's like, hey, these either work or they don't for me. So that's huge, but it's also huge from, because the majority of our, our customers are not pro players on some giant stage. You know, they're, they're bedroom players, or they, they gig, you know, in, in local gigs and stuff. Well, that's, that's just as important, you know, getting their feedback, because that's actually the majority of people you deal with. And then, you know, a lot of people who have vintage guitars and equipment, you know, their input is huge because they have those. So I'm always very open-minded. My ears are wide open to anybody. And I always say when we send off the pickups, please let me know how these work in your guitar. You know, don't just buy the pickup, say thanks, we never hear from you. We want a relationship, you know, and so, uh, yeah, it's all good. Um, so over here, uh, so this is Grant. Um, Grant's been with us for uh, on, three years now. Uh, two years. Two years, okay. Um, so at this workstation, um, so Grant's working on a, a F-Space humbucker right now, amongst some other stuff here. And uh, so this is kind of the assembly area for, well, for all pickups, I mean, for single coils and all that. But again, we do everything in batches. So, um, so that's what he's working on right now. And then the next flow of pickups will come through. So, and then, uh, and then the Cheez-Its. Those are very important <laughs> part of uh, this whole production here. Yeah, I think that's what that's what the company runs on. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> and that's and just true. you know, and, and you you can if you if you can pay in cash or cheese it's. <laughs> yeah, maybe that would work actually. Yeah. <laughs> would that work, Grant? Cheese it? I'll accept that. Okay. I think Grant's sorry. Really done that. It's on camera. <laughs> Hunter is now working on Telecaster bridge pickups. Um, so these are what, Hunter? These are some uh, 52 T's. So these are 52 T's. Again, we do everything in batches because that way you can, like we talked about earlier, you can stay more consistent. We QC all these. So what we try to do is when the bobbin comes over from say Calvin and they come to AJ, AJ then inspects each thing before he puts a bunch of wines on it because we make mistakes and you'll find a completely finished up pickup that you get to the very end and it's screwed up. Well, it could have been caught by, maybe AJ missed that or something. So now it basically, you have to cut the wire off or just even throw the pickup away. So every step that we take, we QC everything to make sure that you don't go through that next phase, next step, and it's, it's a waste of doing that. So. Um, so up to this point, so like you can see here, again, this is like an old Neanderthal way of doing this, just stripping wax. I prefer candle wax under the bridge plate. It's always worked. 
You wanna make sure that you get a really good seal of wax between the plate and the bottom of the bobbin. If you get any kind of air gap at all, it's gonna squeal. So we take great care in making sure when the plates go on, um, in fact, we'll even watch how Hunter does that. Um, and even when they go into the potting, that we inspect it very closely to make sure there's no gaps, you know, that are between the plate and that. Um, sometimes that squeal can be like a tonal thing. You know, I mean, let's face it, Roy Buchanan, you know, you get the guys like Danny Gatton and Roy Buchanan, the guys that can control that on the verge of squealing, that's some of the greatest tone of all time, you know, but we don't want to send them out like that. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> our plates, we do a crazy thing where we do like an aging on these, everyone's different. And uh, it's just kind of my signature thing that I developed a long time ago. Um, and then, so the laser on the, uh, on the bobbins, ironically, when the laser prints on the black bobbins, it's white, so it's perfect for like the, the, the signature and showing up. For these, on that particular laser, we have to spray on, uh, it's like a black spray, like a black paint. And then when you laze onto it, then it imprints onto this. So um, that's one of our things. Um, again, this will be set up where, you know, right now uh, we're doing single coil stuff. I think right now we're kind of in a single coil phase. But then if you came here next week, it would be nothing but either Ellisonics going to Callings or Humbuckers. Uh, I think we have a... Uh, do we have any humbuckers here, Hunter? Yeah. Okay, here so over here, this is a run that, that Hunter finished up. And these are? So these are our Bettys. Um, you know, so we do the, uh, the LRPs, which is the first humbucker that I did for the Leroy Parnell signature guitar back, back in 2012. Um, but I've been testing humbuckers for probably three or four years before we did that deal with Gibson. Um, these are the Bettys named after my mom. Um, these are more, more like the patent uh, style of pickups from like the mid 60s on. Um, so different magnet, different wire. The way we wind them up um, is a little different from the LRPs, which are more PAF-like. Um, and, uh, and then the signature model that I do is there's actually a local guy here um, that has a 57 gold top, and he brought that up and sounded absolutely fantastic. So I'm always asking the guys, look, can I take the back plate off? Can I just put a meter on it and see what these read, you know? And uh, I have another meter that I use that looks at inductance and all this. You try to get as much information as you can. So when I checked those pickups out, the neck pickup was about 9K and the bridge pickup was 9.5K. Well, you would think in terms, normally you'd say, well, those are super hot, so they must have been overwound or whatever. Well, they weren't, it's because of thin wire. So because those sounded so good, I started playing around with that because they were very single coil-like. Um, you could go from playing a Telecaster or a Strat and into like a deluxe reverb, and then when you plugged in that guitar, you didn't have to EQ anything. And that was the thing that really was appealing about it. Because a lot of times with a humbucker, you've got the amp set up a certain way. Um, you have to EQ it a little bit, you know? And, uh, but this wasn't, this was great. So uh, he let me keep the guitar for a couple days. I was able to check it further and then came up with the signature line, which is a different wire, it's thinner gauge wire, um, wound completely different, different magnets that I developed that are custom made. And that's the signature set. So those are cool because they're very single coil like, they're super clear, great note separation. Um, and they don't hit the amp too hard. But if somebody's looking for, you know, like a traditional PAF sound, you know, you want it to be a little more mid-range and drive the amp a little bit more. So again, it's just by application what the customer is looking for. But that's the three models we make right now. And then I'm working, I work with Bill Frizzell uh, on some pickups through Callings Guitars. And so I've done, you know, some special neck pickup for Bill because he plays a lot in the neck pickup and Julian. Um, you know, and you can vary that. You can change the output level. You can do the offset of the coils to make them sound a certain way. Um, so, but we're always, 
always trying new stuff, always working with, you know, pro players and, and or guitar builders, you know, to fit their needs, what they're looking for. Uh, one of the common questions that uh, I hear concerning like your tele pickups is, you know, should I get the 52T or the broadcaster? Because they, you know, the guys yeah. that are like convinced they need a flat pole pickup, and then, you know, how do you push people one way or the other on that pickup? That's hard because, you know, it's like writing up our website is almost ready to launch now and, and trying to write up. How do you describe the difference again? Because a lot of these overlap in sound, you know, you, really the comparison is like if you want the Roy Buchanan sound, if you want that more top end screaming sound, probably the broadcaster. You know, again, it's thinner wire. Um, it's wound up toward the output levels up around 10K. But in reality, the thin wire at 10K is not really hotter than 7.2K with 42 gauge. It's just it's just different because of the the uh, the thickness of the wire. So, but when you do that with the thinner wire and you wind it up to where I've set on and the magnets that I use, um, you get a more peakier top end kind of a sound. But it's not spiky. It's not too bright or in your face. It's an appealing sound and. But I would say if you're looking for more of that bright, spanky uh, top end sound, the broadcaster. But the cool thing about the broadcaster is if you just roll your tone down to about seven, it kind of sounds like the 52T. So it's the broadcaster is a pretty versatile pickup, really. And that's what, when I first met you, that's what Brad, I think, had in, uh, I think it was water. Remember? Yeah. He, he, I, I tried to remember what we did with Brad. Um, and there were also some, some, uh, you know, some mongrel 50s tellies that he had that he had uh, he had put yeah. some pickups in. Yeah, but I think the 52T was one yeah, of them. Yeah, and then Brad, and because of you, working with you, that's where the 5060 idea came from. Yeah. Because, you know, Brad, I remember, and I was working through you, where Brad had a guitar, I think it was an old telly, where the tracking on the bass strings was a little flabby. And Brad, because he walks those bass strings all the time, Thought, well, let's go ahead and put like eight fives on the bridge side or on the, the uh, bass strings, wound strings, and then go with like an A3. And that's kind of where the whole idea of the 5060 yeah. came up. And, and you offer that on the Strat and also on the Tele. And that became like our number one selling uh, Strat pickup was the 5060 thing. Yeah. And uh, so again, it, it's just by application, you know, it, it's, I just look at the whole guitar thing as you're trying to EQ that guitar. You're trying to, to get the best out of, because Every guitar is an acoustic guitar. And I think the best sounding pickups are, it's where you don't really hear the pickups. You're just, you're, you're hearing the acoustic properties because a good guitar is a good guitar unplugged. And, and if you can just transpire that into a, a, you know, going through the amp and bring out all those acoustic properties of the guitar, I think that's a good set of pickups. Yeah. You know, I don't like pickups. I've never liked pickups that are overwound or too mid-rangey. And then when you plug in, you don't even hear the guitar, you're hearing the pickup. And, and that can work in rock and roll, and there's various you know, reasons that, that can work. But in general, when you're talking about like old vintage sound, you're just hearing the guitar, you know, the good guitar. So, but on the tele pickups, you know, there's the broadcaster. The 52T is just your, your like standard wiry, like Bill Hullett, you know, called it best, that smoky, woody, you know, a telecaster sound. Although Bill uses a, a 50B, a broadcaster, in that, that nacho caster that nacho made him years ago. Um, but we make the 60T, which is uh, two raised poles in the, in the middle. Um, and that's, the wine's different on those, Alnico 5 magnets. And that's gonna give you more of that snappier bass response, more of the Bakersfield kind of 60 sound. They work really good for rock and roll because it has that snappy, bright sound. And you know, that's what Keith Richards, I mean, everybody thinks that those old guitars yeah. of Keith's were old Blackguard, they're not. They're like 60s pickups. He yeah. likes that sound, you know, yeah. so. Yeah, the, also those, uh, the staggered bowl pole bridge pickups are also kind of the sound of R&B records and all sorts of things, because you think about yeah. all those records that were made in the 60s, a lot of times they were being made with, you know, relatively new guitars. And they're, new guitars, you know, yeah. So when you think about Wilson yeah. Pickett or Aretha Franklin or Merle Haggard or Buck Owens, I mean, yeah. it was all kind of the same the sound. era of guitar. Well, it's the same with Jimi Hendrix when people talk about Jimi. I mean, yeah, Jimi played old guitars and he had old guitars, but um, I met somebody that actually was a roadie for Hendrix. And he said that if you 
took one of his guitars and you plugged into like a deluxe reverb, it would rip your head off bright. But because Hendrix went through like a 60 foot long cable, yeah, you know, into those Marshalls, well that attenuated the top end, you know. A and coily cord. A coily cord, yeah, <laughs> you know, and, and that all adds up. And then Hendrix had such a, a light touch and so much like Jeff Beck or the great players, it's, it's their fingers, you know, that gets that sound. Um, but yeah, and then the, we also make a 5060 uh, style Telecaster bridge pickup. So that's kind of the range of those. Um, let's see, everything gets magnetized on an old standard. This, is, this has been used, it's what Fender used. Um, we've got a couple of these. Um, so it completely, you see a lot of, a lot of uh, I don't know, pickup manufacturers, but a lot of hobbyists where they'll use a strong magnet to magnetize the, the magnets within the pickup. And it will, but it doesn't saturate. You need something like this that has thousands of gauss that completely saturates and fully magnetizes uh, very evenly. And so you're taking the uh, the bobbin with the magnets, are you putting it with the wire on it and everything? Yeah, Is that when you in put fact, it? we yeah. do it, we do it actually, uh, like here's one here. So this is a Tele, this is a standard plus Tele neck. So, you know, we would just take it. Just drop it in like that. And all you need to do is that. I mean, you don't need to hold it in there very long because again, you know, you've got thousands of gauss that are hitting that and completely saturating those magnets. And there are those Anico 5s. You know, the Anico 5s are gonna be around 550, 600 gauss. So this is, 20 times, you know, what it, uh, the strength of this. So this is fully, fully charged. And you know the, and just talking about magnetics, you know, you, you hear a lot of people talk about, well, you know, if this pickup's 60 years old, it's probably lost a little bit of gauss. Well, that's completely untrue. Magnets don't lose gauss. I mean, they can sit on a shelf for a thousand years and they're, maybe after a thousand years, they'll lose a little bit, but they don't just lose gauss. It has to be either knocked high temperature, which would be, it would melt the pickup, or it has to be another source up against it. And over the years, like I found like, there was a guy that, that had a 59 um, beat to death, most beat to death strat I've ever seen. And it was at my house for a couple of days. And when I checked it with a gauss meter, the neck pickup was degaussed about probably 30%, 20-30%. The middle was a little bit, uh, got degaussed a little bit, and then the breech pickup was full charge. So the only thing that I could think of is think about how many times that was set against an amplifier. You know, the face of the pickups set against it, either the front of the amp or the back, or loaded into a car or whatever. And you know, if you get close enough to a strong magnet that's on a, the back of a speaker or the transformers, um, that can, over time, you know, possibly degauss it. Yeah. But um, yeah, so, you know, some of, the, some of the pickups I've done, I have done some degaussing on it, and you can do that and make it work. Typically, I just don't really care for that. I like to full charge them, you know. If I get an old pickup in, I'll always ask somebody, like even with the stuff I've done for you, you know, some people don't want that touched, you know, just rewind it, then I'll do that. But um, typically, I like to recharge them. Absolutely. And get them back up to full charge. You know? Yeah. And just briefly on the... Because you kind of described the uh, the Tele bridge pickups on the neck pickups, you, you have you know of course you have the the standard plus and you have the tall and you have the the yeah. JL and and uh, yeah so and the, and the mid tall mm -hmm. so just kind of walk through the, the differences or, or you know to me a lot of it is the mid range changes as you as you go through those different models right so on all the the, the Tele neck pickups um, so my standard plus and then there's a mid tall, and I used to do a tall. We still do on request, but basically it's just going to longer magnets. You know, the standard plus is your, your standard style. And that's a big misconception too, because a lot of times on a stock Telecaster, you know, it's going through that circuit that makes it dark and kind of gives it the bassy B3 sound yeah. and all that. But if you actually take that off, those are some of the greatest sounding pickups of all time. Um, so, but we do the regular standard plus size, which I would say is, it has a nice warmth to it, but still clear and articulate. The mid tall 
is going to take like the mid range and the upper end and extend it a little bit, and it gives you more of like a little bit brighter. And then the tall I came up with because of the guys that said, look, I want more of a strap sound. I want right. it to have a little bit of scoop. And so that's the tall. And I used to do it where, um, you know, I would make it to where it would fit within the bobbin, the taller magnet. But then we had issues with the cover, the tangs on the cover, not being able to get those on. So I was cutting those off and I was having to solder on these pieces to make that work. So what I did is I just went with the longer magnet, then I just extended it out the bottom a little bit. Right. So that's the tall. And then we also do a 50-60 tall that actually AJ came up with. It sounds really good also. And then Julian got a hold of me and said, hey, I've got this 54 uh, refin telly and I love the neck pickup on it. I don't think he really cares for the bridge pickup that much, but um, he loved the neck on it. And he said, and on the phone, he literally said, listen to this. And he was tapping it with his fingernail and it was microphonic, you know? And he said, I love the openness and I love that it has a little bit of this scoop thing that I can really dig in um, and the way it integrates and works with the amp. So uh, he said, would you mind trying to recreate that? Well, it turned out it was quite low output and very microphonic. So we did some techniques to it to come up with the JL. And that's been a, a real successful. A lot of the jazz guys like that because it's real clear, it's real articulate, um, but it doesn't work for everything. You know, I've got it. I think I, I showed you on, I've got a, a Blackguard style Telecaster. I think it sounds good in that guitar, but I think it would sound better with the mid tall. So I'll probably swap that out. Um, and again, there you go, because in another Telecaster, I have another Tele at home, and it has a jail, and it sounds absolutely fantastic. So yeah, there's there's so many in yeah. ingredients in the in the final recipe. I mean, there's so many ingredients in yeah. the pickup, and then when you get into the the guitar and the hardware and the strings and the pick and the yeah. wood and the every everything, it, it all adds up. So it does, and that's I'm certainly no expert. I learn every day about this stuff. Every time I pull up a pick guard or I pull up a control plate. I'm like a sponge, you know, you learn from all this, but the thing that we do learn after you've done this over the years is all that comes into account. And, but it starts with these. That's the thing is you have to look and at how a player, I mean, I have, I have friends who are super light players. So if I work on a guitar for them, make pickups for them, it's an entirely different mentality versus a guy that just digs in with his right hand, you know? And so, so. for someone with a lighter touch, what would you do differently? So a lot of times, uh, like a really good friend of mine, Jeff Ruiz, you know, he's got a super light touch. It's kind of like an Eric Johnson touch. Um, and so you can, he can literally go, I mean, I can almost hand him anything and it sounds amazing, but I can't really use Jeff as like an example because he's rare. He's one of those guys, you know, and like I did a little work with Eric Johnson and you know, um, in working with him, I learned a lot about his style and the way he plays and, and all that. But um, but Jeff, you could hand him a like a like a Strat neck pickup at 4K, and he'll come back and go, "Oh my God, this thing sounds amazing." But when you plug it into a regular guy, it doesn't really sound that great. But Jeff knows how to to set up his amp, get the harmonics going, and all that. That it just sounds absolutely amazing under his fingers. So everybody's different, you know, and. So you have to pay attention to that with your customers. And that's why I think, and as we grow here, you know, you can't, you can't be on the phone all day long with each customer, but I like doing that. I mean, I like that personal touch and to be able to, and also, you know, I've always said to every customer we have, this is what I think in talking to you will work, but it might not. So feel free that if you get it in your guitar and it doesn't work, let me know and, and we'll, Maybe don't cut the leads on the pickups or whatever, but we can send you another set in exchange that may work better for that particular situation. You know, and because of the bottom line is, I mean, I want everybody to have the best possible tone they can. And, and like we've talked about so many times, the feel, the feel of all these pickups, no matter what you talk about, if you pick up a guitar and it has feel, it's gonna sound good because feel's more important than, to me than uh, it's everything in a guitar. But, um, but over here, um, we've got, again, these are the, this is a batch of, uh, these are all standard pluses um, that we're doing. And, and you can see that, you know, after they're wound, some of these have a little potting inside the cover. Um, all the Telecaster neck pickups um, are not potted in wax, they're potted in enamel. And we thin the enamel down and we keep them in at a 
a certain length of time. Um, some of the covers, you put lacquer in, some you don't. There's different techniques to getting the potting just right on these. Um, what about nickel silver covers versus like plated brass? So yeah, so the in 50, I think, in through like halfway through 51, they were using brass covers. And again, everything from Fender, there's a big overlap, you know? And I even uh, rewound a 53 uh, cover that was all brass. And literally, I mean, it looked like brass. It was completely worn off a little bit, and it was super thick, that particular one. So I've seen them where they're thick, where they're thin, you know, it was all the map. But typically, if you have a solid brass cover, it kind of attenuates the top end a little bit, but, but it sounds really good. It's got a great sound to it. And so if you can sacrifice a little bit of the top end, um, it's beautiful. But, um, but mostly what we do, everything's nickel silver. And so, and that's where the whole standard plus thing, people laugh about this sometimes because they see the STD. So it's like, it's, sorry, these aren't disease people. It's just, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but the plus means nickel silver cover. So if I do just a standard, it's a, it's a copper cover, you know, brass cover. Yeah. And, um, and we get requests for that. You know, um, some people, some people really like, you know, that sound, um, like Rick Holmstrom. Um, he's a good friend of mine and, and Rick, I think he has a couple pickups that I did for him where we put the, either the stock brass cover back on, or I think I even put on a brass cover for him. He loves that sound. He's an amazing And he's player. amazing. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, his work yeah, you with, did the interview with him. And, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and just yeah, yeah. He's he's an amazing player and and you know and hardcore tone hound and uh, oh, he knows time. he knows what he wants and he knows and he has to deal with the yeah. fly dates all the time. You know, so so yeah. much of the time, and so he's really has his guitar dialed in. He's a good example. I mean, Rick, I've known him for years, and you know, and and uh, I mean, he'll say that you know, while I think that that pickup sounds great that you do, but this is what I'm looking for. Yeah. You know, and he's real because he's been through it. He's been over it and over it. He knows what works for him. So, um, yeah, Rick's a great guy. Um, and then, uh, so these, we're getting these packed up. You know, those are all, these are all standard plus uh, telling next. We typically put them, get them all together. We QC everything as we go. And then that way you have confidence that when you pull it out, you put that in the packaging to ship it out. It's QC. And that's the thing with, with all the guys that we talk about all the time is QC. And every, you know, we get stuff back. I mean, it just happens. And, uh, you know, then we'll sit down. What I typically do is get everybody together and say, look, this came back. Let's look at this. And why is that? Let's learn from it so this doesn't happen again. Um, but there's that. The, the potting, <laughs> this is, you know, we're definitely coming up with a little bit, uh, you know, larger potting but i've these are some of the same pots i've had i think for 10 years you know um and so you just get the wax hot and dip them in there well it's, it's a combination of wax you use it's a little ratio of uh of uh of beeswax and uh and then we we have some that you put the uh you know black uh soot in it to give it the, the black look and so like these here these are uh <clears throat> these are jazz master pickups that we're just starting to, to, you know, Grant's been working on those. Um, so again, you know, what you have to do with these is you have to, you have to get them in the guitar and then you have to get somebody who is very familiar, who is like a pro or somebody that has a signature name on these pickups to really approve them, you know? And, and, uh, and again, with, with all the Fender stuff, with all these different pickups, there's so many variations over the years. You can't, you can generalize about what Fender did over the years with their staggers and their wire and all that, but um, it varied a lot, you know? And uh, same with Jazzmaster pickups and all these bass pickups. We're working on P bass and jazz bass pickups. And uh, so, and there's a couple of guys up in LA who are pro players that are gonna test these for us and work with us on that. Um, these are, so here's, a, here's an example of uh, Tilly Bridges, these are 52 T's. So what we do is, you, so as you saw, Hunter, put the wax on the bottom, you lightly screw down the screws here, um, and then you dip it in the wax, 
and uh, we either hang them on or just hold them in there for a specific amount of time. And, uh, and then when you tighten this down, you make sure that it gets full adhesion of wax between the plate and the, and the, the bobbin. So these are taped. So these were, these were um, dipped the first time and then we put the string around it and then these will go back in, these will go into the black and dip the second time. So again, different techniques for, uh, for different pickups, different amount of time, they go into the, the potting. Um, like on Telly Next, and there's some other proto stuff we're doing and other pickups where we use um, uh, uh, lacquer instead of the, the wax. Uh, some of the stuff when it gets really cold in here, we have a preheater because one thing is if you, if you take like this pickup on a cold day when it's 50 degrees in here, it's cold. And if you put it in the wax, for the first minute, you're just gonna see it go pure white because it just solidifies on there because this is cold. So what we do is we regulate the temperature and make sure everything goes in so the exposure to the uh, wax potting is consistent, you know, which is really important. And again, these are all like little things, the little steps, each step that adds up to this little recipe we talk about. And uh, so these are actually, some of these are getting ready to go out um, to a couple of dealers that we have. Um, and then we have a distributor that we're working with um, overseas. So we're getting these ready. So this is our stock that's ready to go. Um, we're working right now on some new designs for packaging. This is kind of our old school you know, packaging that we've had. And, I mean, it's not the most elaborate, you know, but, um, but it works. And, uh, but we're gonna come up with, you know, some different, more custom packaging. But yeah, so, you know, I mean, in here, you can see we have a lot of space <laughs> above us. This is like three stories high. Um, so we're probably gonna put in a mezzanine you know, down on that end. There's Leroy up there that oversees everything we do. That's Leroy Parnell. <laughs> Leroy's a good friend of mine. Um, but yeah, we'll probably put in a mezzanine up there. That way we can put all our storage stuff up there and then we can have more, you know, workspace down here. Um, over here is kind of our dirty part of the, the shop. You know, we do our, we hand grind all of the, the magnets, literally each magnet by hand. Um, you know, we, we do a lot of hand work with the drill press. Um, and when, and when yeah. you say grind the magnets, are you grinding like the ends or the, or the you know, for what purpose? Yeah, Calvin can oh, actually. Yeah. Absolutely, I need to do this right now, so. He, the, these are Ellisonic stuff. And uh, so, and you know, every manufacturer does this, but I mean. That's what we're trying to get to. So this is one here. You know, you get the right bevel on it and it has to look consistent. You know, it's really easy to get like a, you know, kind of a faceting look on it that doesn't look right. So we try to get the, you know, the. Uh, so you're, you're grinding for the bevel on the magnet. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And you know, that bevel, that's another thing too. You know, so the bevel has a lot to do with how that interacts on the guitar also. You know, uh, I mean, I think originally Fender did it because a sharp edge of a magnet is brittle and it can crack. Um, and you know, some of the players also, you know, you didn't want that sharp magnet sticking up like on a strat set or whatever, but it also changes the way the magnetic field lines come up. I mean, the field lines come up through the top of the magnet and they come up, you know, like the earth, like you see the field lines coming around the earth, north and south. Um, if you put a bevel on it, what that does, because magnetics loves corners. So if you look at this and it's perfectly square, like at this end, you're gonna get the field lines coming out like this, and you're also gonna have field lines that wanna come out at 45 degrees. Well, if you get your E string and your B string together, you're gonna to get magnetic interference between the E string and the B string. Um, so if you bevel it, the bevel, beveling will actually eliminate a lot of those field lines wanting to go over. And you know, it, it's subtle between the, all the strings, but that is an effect. And depending on where the string is, I think they call it the like magnetic crotch is where the field lines come up right where the string sits. And that's where you get your interaction. It's basically inductor is all it is. And uh, so anyway, for
for the different pickups that we do, some are beveled more than others for various reasons. So, um, but yeah, so here's just the manually how we do it. So as you can see, when, when you talk about like hand work, I mean, we're everything we do from, from manufacturing, from the bobbins to grinding the magnets, I mean, we do everything pretty much in house. You know, you can have the beveling done, we could have it done and they'd probably charge you, I don't know, 10 cents a magnet or whatever. Um, I actually had a company that did that. It was terrible, it looked like hell. I mean, they were all faceted and, and they just didn't look right. So you just end up doing it yourself. It's, you know, you control it then, you know, yeah. so. Um, but no, you know, moving forward, I mean, that's our operation right now. Um, the thing that's really important for, for all of us here is that, you know, how do you increase, you know, your, your sales, the amount that you put out and then keep the quality, you know, it, it's really hard. I mean, AJ has been with me for, uh, I think he started working on pickups when he was like 13 years old, you know, he's 32 now. And, um, Grant and Hunter have been on board for, it's going on three years. Um, Calvin came down from Oregon um, about eight months ago and uh, probably have to hire a couple more people on, you know, that can do things like the grinding, the manufacturing of, of the bobbins. Um, but it's just trying to keep the, the QC level, you know, and just not change anything with a constant flow of materials that you get that changes. That's the, that's the hardest thing, you know, and um, so it's a challenge. I mean, it's a challenge for every pickup maker, guitar manufacturer, amp maker. Uh, Mike Moody is a dear friend of mine with Magic Amplification. And, you know, it's just, it's amazing what you have to put into an amplifier. And the resistors that you used to get from that particular supplier, he didn't have them anymore. So then you go to get another batch, they're different. You know, and I've heard Mike say that, I got in all these, you know, like Allen Bradley resistors and I can only use like 10% of them, you know, because they're all out of spec. And so I can't even imagine what like amplifier manufacturers deal with. You know? So uh, it's a challenge, but it, it's a fun challenge, you know, so. And then moving forward, you know, we're, we're definitely gonna expand on new custom pickups that we're doing and then expand upon the, like the vintage pickups. We get requests all the time for, you know, gold foil pickups. Um, which is kind of in the direction of what we're doing with Ellisonics and, and some of these other pickups. But, um, you know, and everything we do, we're going to prototype it and do it like we did from the start. If it's a Telecaster pickup, you have to do tons of research on it and you have to try it and you have to send it out to the people you trust and like you and, uh, and develop it. But nothing goes out until there's a lot of feedback that it's right. You know, and it's, and it's worth releasing. I mean, why... Why just release something that's been done it over, over and over again? You know, so the, the Ellisonics are a really, really great pickup. It's just the the openness of them, and uh, it's it's, yeah. it's 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 not often that I get uh, tempted by a pickup that's not uh, what's normally used in a Telecaster. But yeah, it's a, it's a great great design. I think they're all versatile. You know, it's like Julian, you know, uses it uh, that guitar primarily now, and uh, Collings did a great job on the whole development of that. You know, with those pickups in it, I think, maybe not in that guitar, but like, uh, you know, I have other guitars that I've put the Ellisonics in, and it's kind of, you get a little bit of Tele, you get a little bit of Strat, P90, Humbucker. Really, it's kind of reminiscent of a lot of these mixed up into the same pickup. It's kind of cool. Yeah. So, uh, so we're excited about that. Yeah. But uh, that's what we do here. Well, Ron, thank you so much for uh, let, letting me come out to uh, to see your, uh, your your workshop here. It's uh, been a, a very very cool process to to get to see and uh, to get to see how the pickups in my guitars were actually made. So, uh, thank you. Absolutely. Well, it's it's always as we said when you showed up. I think it's been 
10 years or something since we actually saw each other. We've talked a lot on the phone and, and yeah. interviews and stuff, but uh, no, it's a pleasure. It's been fun having you. All right. Thank you, Ron. Thank you.